Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Collier. I'm the Executive Director of Renew Theatres, which manages the Ambler County Highway and Garden Theatres. I want to thank you all for joining us um, from whichever of those four theatres you regularly frequent, or if you are not a regular frequent uh, theatre goer of ours and happen to be calling in from somewhere else, thank you for joining us on this chat. Um, this is the second of a two-part discussion. Um, which Hannah led us through the first part last week, talking about Hitchcock's films in England. Um, and we are very excited for tonight's second piece um, discussing The Lady Vanishes. So um, just the boilerplate things that I need to get out of the way. I just wanna remind everyone that this series is sponsored by the Vesta Fund and that allows us to make this free for our members. So a big thank you to the Vesta Fund for their support and an even bigger thank you to all of you members um, for your support at the theater and for joining us in this conversation tonight. Again, we ask everyone, if you're not speaking, um, to remain on mute um, if you, until I call on you uh, using the raise hand. That helps it uh, flow smoothly for everyone. Um, Hannah's going to do a bit of an intro again, and then we will open it up to discussion. So for those of you who are just joining us, um, we are thrilled to have Hannah Jack um, again sharing um, this conversation on Hitchcock. And before I dive into her bio, I, I did have a question earlier on if Hannah will be doing more events. Um, and Hannah and I had a conversation to speak last week and have agreed to do a monthly event um, for the rest of the year. Um, so we still need to pick the films, uh, but we're really excited to have Hannah on the books for, uh, for the rest of 2021. So lots of exciting classic films coming ahead. Uh, so stay tuned to the emails and uh, we'll announce those titles as we put them together. Um, so Hannah is a professional writer for Turner Classic Movies, uh, scripting the introductions for the movies that air on the network delivered by the TCM hosts. Um, she's also written hosted introductions for HBO Max Filmstruck and classic movies screen in theaters around the country as part of Fathom Events. We are thrilled that she is back in Doylestown and back to her native county theater um, and even happier to have her leading this series and um, to have more films with her lined up for 2021. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Hannah. Great, thank you so much. I'm so, so excited uh, to be joining everybody uh, monthly for the rest of the year. And so grateful to you all for coming uh, back this week. I hope that everyone was able to catch last week because uh, we will be picking up kind of where we left off. But I had a great um, suggestion from someone who, who uh, was a participant in last week's talk to bring in more visual aids. Um, so I am going to actually screen share some production stills and uh, images of uh, the people I'm talking about as I talk at you in this first little bit um, to kind of help jog the memory. I sometimes forget who I'm, you know, the, the faces that I'm describing. Um, so this might help. And uh, that was a great suggestion. If anyone has suggestions for future talks, like Chris said, we're gonna keep doing this monthly. Um, I'm always open to hearing uh, what your feedback is. So um, like Chris said in the chat, if you have you know comments or things that you'd like to mention that are not uh, questions, um, go ahead and you can use the chat as I'm talking. But uh, he, as he mentioned, we're, we're gonna try to have the questions be you know verbalized later. So um, if you have a specific question, I'm probably not going to get to see it until much later. So ha hang on to that question, remember it, and use the raise hand um, feature uh, as soon as I'm done kind of talking at you in this beginning. And then we can like verbalize those questions and I can definitely be sure to address them. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, with you and give me one moment. Let me just, sorry, did I disappear? Hold on. Um, hang on one second. Sorry about that. So, um, okay, here we go. I'm going to share the screen with you here. And there we go. This should be that. And I'm hoping, thank you. Does everyone, can I get a thumbs up if you see a bunch of movie posters? Cool. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to just move this around. Thank you for bearing with me through the tech here. So last week we talked, We this series, as Chris said, is called Hitchcock in England. And the focus here 
um, is the first two decades of his career before he moved to Hollywood. Last week, we talked about the 39 Steps, um, which was released in 1935. And this week, we're talking about The Lady Vanishes, which is really the last major movie that uh, Hitchcock made in England uh, in 1938. And it was the pivotal you know, moment that um, sort of rounded out his career in England and then brought him um, to Hollywood. So tonight I'm gonna pick up kind of where we left off um, in, the 19, in the mid 1930s um, and we can take a look at kind of what led to The Lady Vanishes and then how that led to the next chapter of his career in Hollywood. So what you're looking at here um, is the, the kind of string of movies he made in the mid 1930s before, right before The Lady Vanishes. Um, so Hitchcock, as I mentioned last week, made his directorial debut, his first feature film as a director in 1925. And for 10 years, uh, 39 Steps came out in 1935. So a full decade um, had gone by and Hitchcock was a, um, an acclaimed director in England, but um, it really took those 10 years for him to finally conquer the American critics and earn the attention uh, of Hollywood producers. And at this point, he was also in the mid 1930s being called uh, in American reviews, the master of suspense. That's when that, that moniker first became attached to him. And it was because of these movies that, um, that you're seeing here. The began with The Man Who Knew Too Much in 1934, followed by The 39 Steps. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Give me one moment. You guys can all see. Okay, one second here. Sorry. Um, I want to make sure that you guys can just see the the images. Was there an issue with that? Um, okay, sorry. One moment. So, sorry. This screen share is new to me. So let me um, let me try this one more time. Um, Okay. Is that better? Great. Okay, so um, he was finally uh, he was finally conquering the American critics, and he was uh, it was because of these films: The Thirty Nine Steps, Secret Agent, um, Sabotage, Young and Innocent. These were movies that um, were all like espionage thrillers, more or less, and were um, establishing his style and his tone. So. He finally had this like attention from Hollywood producers, but it wasn't until um, 1937 that really anything became, it really came of that. Um, Young and Innocent was a movie he made in 1937 and he was ready to move to Hollywood, but he still had one more film that he had to make on his contract at Gaumont in England. Um, and he knew that after that one movie was done, the future was just uncertain. So, he uh, had this other offer to stay in England from the um, producer who had given him many opportunities throughout his career, a man named Michael Balkin, who um, was uh, one of the most important film producers in England. Um, and Balkin had offered him the opportunity to stay in England, but work for MGM's new branch that uh, was being established there um, with a good salary and multiple picture contract and all of that. but. Uh, Hitchcock really resisted it because he wanted to move to Hollywood. So anyway, he finishes Young and Innocent and he still has one more movie to make in England. And he's wondering what is going to happen next in his career. At the same time, he's got what who you're looking at here are um, on the left hand side here is a man named Myron Selznick. And this is a young Hitchcock that is Hitchcock with a mustache. And Myron Selznick um, and Hitchcock knew each other from the 20s. Myron was a major uh, agent in Hollywood. And he was starting to advocate for Hitchcock to get him a contract with a Hollywood producer. And um, Hitchcock, uh, there, were, there were sort of two producers who were it, at, in the forerunners in um, making a, a deal with Hitchcock to bring him to Hollywood. And one of those was Walter Wanger and the other was Myron Selznick's brother, David O. Selznick, whose name might, might be uh, familiar. And that's who you see uh, on the right-hand side there too. So David O. Selznick um, was uh, 
a very established sort of boy wonder um, uh, producer in Hollywood had been working for a number of studios and making prestigious movies at RKO at MGM and had just left to go out on his own and form Selznick International Pictures. And he uh, made it clear that he intended to bring, to be the producer to bring Hitchcock to Hollywood. Um, but it would be two years, this was in 1937, it would be two years before that actually materialized. And there were two reasons for that. One was that Hitchcock uh, had certain demands that Selznick wasn't really ready to meet. For instance, he demanded a fairly high salary because he could, he needed uh, to you know, have the incentive to leave uh, a high salary he was drawing in England. And it was gonna be expensive for him as a non-resident to live and work in the US. And he also demanded more than one um, picture. He wanted a two picture deal or more because he knew, and he was right, that the first movie he made in Hollywood would um, be subject to the creative input of whatever producer or studio he was working for. He knew that the first movie he made in Hollywood really wouldn't be an Alfred Hitchcock movie. It would be shaped by whoever was, you know, he had to impress uh, in, in Hollywood. And then he wanted the chance to have a second movie in his contract so that he could really prove himself and make an original Hitchcock picture. Selznick resisted this. So that was one reason why these, you know, it's 1937 and he didn't, it took two years for him to get to Hollywood. And the other reason is that David O. Selznick was a little bit busy with a movie that he was producing called Gone with the Wind. So Selznick was totally, totally distracted um, by this epic production. And Hitchcock really um, was kind of an afterthought uh, for the, at the beginning of these negotiations. So, like I said, he had this one more picture that he had to make in England before anything could really be decided. And Hitchcock typically liked to have um, his project to, to be the one to come up with his next project, to propose an idea, but he didn't have any more ideas at this point uh, that he was eager to do. So an idea was given to him by um, a British producer, uh, uh, Edward Black, and uh, it was a script that was written by Frank Launder and Sidney Gilliatt uh, called The Lady Vanishes, adapted from a book um, by a Welsh writer uh, that had just come out of suspense novel. And it, the adaptation kind of, uh, it wasn't written by Hitchcock, but it brought out all these elements that really were Hitchcockian and it was a perfect fit for him. It had, you know, the missing body and the speeding train and the suspense and the romance and the comedy. And uh, when Hitchcock read it, as you see there, um, he did, he really gravitated toward it. It was a project for him. He also added elements to the script. He added a lot of what you saw at the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie, um, the shootout in the woods and the uh, sort of the revolving door cast of characters who come through the inn at the beginning were Hitchcock embellishments in, this, in the film. And he also really, as he often did in his movies, built up the supporting characters. Hitchcock loved the supporting characters in his movie it's, and he's, he often felt like they were the most interesting. And so a lot of times when you come away from a Hitchcock movie, it's the, it's the characters, it's the supporting characters, the character actors who uh, maybe linger in your minds the longest. And in this case, he had a really, a, a, um, like an exciting idea to cast characters in the supporting roles against type. So you have um, people like Dame May Whitty as Miss Froy um, on the left there. She was a um, very established stage actress on both sides of the Atlantic, but um, more for playing, you know, uh, elegant, refined types. So to cast her as a spy was totally offbeat. Um, you have Paul Lucas up at the top here who um, was in Hollywood, was a dashing leading man. He was a romantic, uh, figure and Hitchcock cast him as the evil doctor villain, um, which again was against type and uh, paved the way for, for Paul Lucas to start playing more villainous types. And people like Catherine Lacey, who was an, a glamorous actress in England, is cast as this very unglamorous role of this double agent who poses as a nun. Um, but all of these uh, supporting characters paled by comparison when it uh, premiered in England. Um, to these two guys, um, Basil Radford and Naughton Wayne, they were the biggest hit of the movie with English audiences in the characters of Caldecott and Charters, um, who were 
uh, these, you know, cricket obsessed quintessential English uh, gentlemen. And they were such a huge hit with audiences that um, the characters and the actors reappeared in a handful of other movies totally unrelated to The Lady Vanishes uh, over the next couple of years. They played, uh, Caldecott and Charters just showed up in these other movies um, over the next few years in England. And they, the two of them also, they had both been dramatic actors before and had never been united as a team and certainly not a comedy team before this movie. Um, and uh, English audiences just ate it up and they continued to, um, perform together both as these characters and as similar characters with different names uh, over the next roughly decade, um, spawning a BBC radio series together and a BBC TV series. They were a huge, huge hit. Um, so, but in terms of the leads, Hitchcock cast two actors who were established but in different mediums. Margaret Lockwood was a, a movie star in England at the time and Michael Redgrave uh, this was his first movie role of any significance. Um, and he was an established stage star at the time. He was appearing on stage at the time with John Gilgood. But um, the fact that he was a stage trained actor kind of caused some contention on the set. Hitchcock loved, as I said last week, was a huge theater goer, loved and admired um, stage actors and often got his casting inspirations from watching actors perform on stage. But um, when it came to uh, performing on set for him, he had absolutely no patience for, you know, stage training or any sort of, you know, naturalistic acting style. Hitchcock was all about, it has, the actor is just like any other part of the visual in the frame, the actor's uh, there to convey the visual story. And so if Hitchcock wanted the actor to lean over the table and the actor didn't feel like it was right for their character, it didn't matter. It had to be that way because that's how the shot needed to look. And, you know, if the actor had to look like anguished or shocked, it didn't matter if they felt anguish or shock as long as their face showed it. That was Hitchcock's approach to acting. That was not Michael Redgrave's approach to acting. He was very much about finding the motivation. And so they came, they like, you know, didn't really see eye to eye for, for a while at the beginning. Um, Hitchcock famously said, uh, was attributed, the phrase, the phrase was attributed to him, actors are cattle, meaning that, um, you know, actors are just there to, like cattle to be prodded and put wherever. And he later said, you know, I didn't say that, I said actors should be treated like cattle, um, that they're just, you know, part of the, shot the way that the scenery is part of the shot. But Michael Redgrave remembered later that that phrase was said in reference to him at one point. What finally turned uh, the, the corner um, on this set was that uh, Paul Lucas, who I mentioned before, who was the villainous doctor, was an actor Michael Redgrave really, really admired. And he said to him, you know, you're not even trying to fit into the world of filmmaking. And Redgrave was like, okay, you're right. And he gave it a shot to do it Hitchcock's way. And I don't know about you, but I think it's a great performance that, he, that uh, came out in the end. But um, so this, what you're looking at here is a shot of, um, of, of the actual production. The movie was shot um, at a British studio that had a lot of, at this point, the British uh, film industry was struggling financially significantly, which is one of the reasons Hitchcock wanted to be in Hollywood instead to have more resources. So the entirety of The Lady Vanishes was shot on a 90 foot um, platform that was create that was made to uh, look like a, a train coach. And it was just refurnished for the different scenes and the different um, parts of the train. So it was really shot, this movie was kind of ideal to be shot on threadbare conditions because all the sets, if you think about it, are just really rooms, that's it. And so Hitchcock was uh, asked to make use of these minimal resources in the most creative possible ways. And, and he made use of things like miniatures. I'm sure it you know, dawned on, on you while you were watching that opening that it might've been done in miniature. The opening shot of that village, the snow covered village was absolutely miniatures. A lot of the trains that uh, we see were miniatures. There's a lot of projection, rear projection with trains going by on screens. So they didn't really have um, 
a ton you know of, of resources to make this movie but he did get creative in a in a lot of ways and one of which was the first introduction of a gimmick that you might recognize from later hitchcock movies um, which is these uh, oversized props that take the focus. In this scene in particular, um, uh, the doctor has, he thinks he's poisoned the two drinks um, that he's giving the, uh, that he's giving the two leads. And Hitchcock thought about the fact that this is um, a pretty trite moment. You know, this comes up in a lot of stories where you know, some the person has poisoned the drink and then we're waiting around to see if the recipient is gonna actually drink it. So he decided to make it a little bit more interesting by bringing the glasses to the foreground. And uh, what he had, the way he accomplished this was that he actually had king-sized glasses constructed. So what you're looking at here are grossly oversized props. That is how he achieved that shot. Um, and it's a shot that he would continue, it's a gimmick that he would continue to use, but this was the first time. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie um, Notorious, for instance, um, there's, a, there's a coffee cup that plays a very similar role in a scene and it's very much in the foreground. Uh, and movies like Spellbound, there's a gun at the very end that, that is similarly in the foreground to call our attention to the, the, how that prop functions in the scene. Um, so midway through The Lady Vanishes, like I said, this was his last movie on his last British contract. He didn't know what the future held and he was still waiting to find out um, what was happening with Selznick and if there was going to be a Hollywood contract. So in the meantime, he agreed as a favor to his friend Charles Lawton to make one movie that Lawton wanted him to direct, uh, which was Jamaica Inn which was also shot in England. Um, Charles Lawton was not only starring, but producing, and it's, it's famously the movie that gave Maureen O'Hara her first movie role. Um, so he agreed to make this movie. He had no interest in making this movie, but Jamaica Inn would be Hitchcock's last British picture um, because while he was, uh, right after The Lady Vanishes wrapped, he took it upon himself at his own expense to go to Hollywood for the very first time in his life. He brought his family with him and he wanted to meet with Selznick in person and potentially with other producers to finalize some kind of contract. And that's what he basically did. He met with Selznick. Selznick had, had proposed bringing Hitchcock to Hollywood to direct a movie based on the sinking of the Titanic. And um, Hitchcock was all set to get you know, that started. And he got to Hollywood and Selznick like brushed off that idea and said, you know what I have instead, I should mention that Jamaica Inn was based on a novel by Daphne du Maurier. Selznick bought Daphne du Maurier's latest novel, Rebecca. And he said, you know, I have this novel, Rebecca, and that's what we should, that's what should be your first movie. So Hitchcock got a sense right from the beginning that working in Hollywood was equivalent to being subject to the whims of creative producers. He knew that whatever he was had to agree to, he had to agree to it, you know, just the producer was king in Hollywood, basically. And finally, Selznick proposed a deal that wasn't really what Hitchcock wanted, but it was the opening to America. So he agreed, he signed a contract, and he finished making Jamaica Inn back in England. Um, and yet, uh, even though Selznick announced that uh, Rebecca would be, the Hitchcock was coming to Hollywood and Rebecca would be their first movie together. There were still delays in getting that started because Selznick was so preoccupied with Gone with the Wind. And what finally lit the fire under him and got him to bring Hitchcock to Hollywood was The Lady Vanishes premiered. Premiered in 1938 and it won Hitchcock the award for best director of 1938 from the New York film critics. And that is what made Hitchcock seem like a really huge deal in the United States. It was this movie and that award. And Selznick worried that another producer was going to sweep in and get Hitchcock to make his debut before the Selznick contract kicked in. Uh, and Hitchcock was gonna make his Hollywood debut under somebody else's banner. And that's what got Hitch uh, Selznick to finalize their deal, uh, bring Hitchcock as quickly as possible to the United States and get working on Rebecca as soon as he was done uh, with Jamaica Inn. 
And so this is his cameo from uh, The Lady Vanishes, but in terms of travel, he did finally leave England um, on, in March of 1939 and moved to Hollywood. Um, the news hit kind of hard in, uh, in England. The, Hitchcock was their you know, genius director and he was leaving. And he was leaving at not a super great time to leave England. Um, in terms of if you are in England still looking at someone who's a kind of a national hero departing because uh, war was very much on the horizon. And Rebecca actually started filming uh, just days after uh, England and France declared war on Germany. So Hitchcock kind of, it was looked at in certain circles that Hitchcock was kind of deserting his country in its hour of need. Um, not that he could have served, but he certainly could have put his filmmaking skills to use. And we can talk more about that too. But anyway, he started off in a new country. Uh, you know, he was almost 40 years old, new chapter of his career. He would spend almost the next four decades in Hollywood, beginning with Rebecca, which re was released in 1940. And as he predicted, Rebecca was very much a project that the producer had a heavy hand in. Um, and yet it did remarkably well the movie earned 11 Oscar nominations, including winning the Oscar for Best Picture of 1940. So his Hollywood debut won the Academy Award for Best Picture, and it earned him a, an Oscar nomination as well. Um, the first of what would be five Oscar nominations um, throughout his career. So this was the you know beginning of the end of his, his career in England was The Lady Vanishes, and then the Hitchcock we know and we think of a lot um, nowadays, when we think of his work, we think of the Hollywood output. Um, and that was kind of where this began. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for a moment. Um, and we can open it up to have a discussion. I hope, it, does it, everyone see the screen share has stopped? Is that, thank you. Thank you for bearing with me uh, with the technology. I really appreciate it. Great. So I see some stuff came through the chat, but uh, Chris, if you wanna moderate questions. Go from there. I can take a look at the chat too. Yeah, it looks like Grant has a question. Yeah, I forget the name of the character, but when he's changing train cars and is almost hit by the oncoming uh, train car, do you know how that was done? Yeah, that was. Are you you're talking about when he's climbing out a window? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was through a projection. So that was just he was on the side of the car, and there was a, a movie screen next to him. Yeah, and that's what I figure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. And it looks like Eric. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, trains show up in uh, many of Hitchcock's films, and I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. You know, it, it's in The 39 Steps, it's in The Lady Vanishes, and, and it's in many others, including uh, my favorite, North by Northwest. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I wonder what, what, oh, what sure. you have on that. Yeah. The fascination. Yeah. Um, it's a great, it's a great, great question. So Hitchcock personally loved trains and prided himself on memorizing timetables from the time he was a kid. He, um, he, when he first went to New York, which I didn't mention this, but he, um, was uh, he did travel to New York in 1937 just before making The Lady Vanishes. That was his first time. He was born in 1899, obsessed with America, but had never been to America until 1937. Got to New York, knew all of the timetables of all of the New York trains because he had been obsessed with them. And people said, how do you know? How, like, when was the last time you were in New York? And he said, I've never been. This was just something he personally loved. Uh, ships too, he was obsessed with the ports of call. Um, and he, he wanted, he thought when he was a kid that he might be a navigator. That was like his early, early interest. But I think on top of that interest, um, the, the confined space and the fact that it's in motion allowed for a lot of suspense, a lot of uh, inability to kind of get out of that situation. So that, you know, that, that was um, a trope that he came back to, but he did say when he first um, came to Hollywood, he had to take the train across the country. He uh, sailed to New York and then took the train across the country and felt that he could never have made The Lady Vanishes on an American train because the American trains were so much more spacious and you know comfortable and there were all kinds of things that didn't 
lend to that like claustrophobic feel that uh, he felt and that old kind of antiquated feel that he felt he was able to capture uh, in the way he vanishes. But yeah, trains come up over and over again. Absolutely. All right, uh, next up was Remy and then we'll get to you, Elise. Yeah, I was just wondering if you have any insight into why he decided to go with a, a, a made up country and a made up language rather than a real country and a real language for yeah. uh, the location. Yeah, Bandrika is the name of this uh, fictional land, right? Um, it's a great question. He, uh, so this was made obviously at a time when England was on the brink of war. Uh, Hitler was um, building, you know, and expanding uh, his, his power. And um, Hitchcock did not explicitly refer to Germany or to Nazis uh, in during his the British port part of his career and even into some of his American films too. It was a lot safer to allude to some sort of stand in. Um, but it's important to remember that, you know, Hitchcock was a young man during World War I and villains in his films almost always have some sort of German influenced uh, accent or culture or something. The villains are, are not, in his political films at least, the villains uh, in the 1930s and 40s are very Germanic. And so it's clear who these, who these villains are. And it was clear to audiences at the time who these villains are, but it was shrouded in this like pretend there I forgetting the other movie that came to mind a moment ago um, but there's there's another fictional stand-in for a you know middle European nation um, that comes up in one of his early Hollywood films I'll think of it in a moment but yeah so and and the message is clear at the end of this movie that uh, you know the, the characters at the end are uh, you know, taking their stand in terms of, well, they can't hurt us. There were British subjects. That's explicit, even though the, you know, the actual enemy is not explicit. The fact that these are, we're, we're you know, we're British, they can't hurt us. And even um, Cecil Parker's character at the end goes out and thinks he could wave the flag and, or the handkerchief and be fine. And he can't be. And so the message also was there in 1938 that England is foolish if it thinks it can appease Hitler, which was, you know, very much a political message that the movie was making, uh, even though it was shrouded in these other, uh, you know, pretend languages and pretend lands. Yeah. There's a related question to that, um, asking about the Yiddish and whose idea it was to drop the Yiddish in. Do you have a... Oh, the, yeah, because there's like a little bit of like oy vey's me, right? I think that the language, um, the more I listen to that fake language, the more it sounds like a blending of all kinds of language. There are some, uh, you know, words that sound sort of Italian and there are some words that sound sort of, you know, more Eastern European. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure who, I would assume that it's Sidney Gilliatt and Frank Launder who were the screenwriters who uh, wrote in that made up language, but it's a great question. Elise, you were next. Okay, thank you. Um, Hannah, you kind of touched a little bit upon this in your last answer, but um, it seems to me that this was like a Hitchcock comedy. It was frothy. A lot of the dialogue was really hilarious and they didn't pause on it. So you had to just sort of chuckle to yourself and continue paying attention. But I wanted to ask you about kind of the bones of the screenplay, because it occurred to me that that next to last scene, when all the Brits are in that one car and it gets extremely, it's like heavy handedly, um, you know, metaphorical about what was going on in the world with, mm -hmm. you know, you know um, isolationism versus participating in the, in, in, in the world stage. Um, was that part of the original source? Was that added by the screenwriters? Was that added by Hitchcock or what? Yeah, the political, it's a great question. The political angle of this was added by the screenwriters. Um, the Hitchcock was very reluctant to take a political stand in his movies. He was not someone who was overtly political, 
um, although he was someone who was quietly political in his support for England. Um, even when he was in Hollywood, he uh, was friendly with and kind of helped to lead a group of expats from England who uh, were doing their bit for the war effort in England. Um, and he did return to England throughout the war um, to make contributions in, as a filmmaker. Um, he returned and he tried, you know, he made a couple of films for the Ministry of Information. Unfortunately, those movies, it's unclear whether they were ever released. So his war filmmaking work, unlike other Hollywood directors who made war propaganda and made war films that we know much better, um, Hitchcock's movies that he made uh, that were much more overtly political propaganda kind of floundered and some of them were shelved. Um, but yeah, I think that the, where Hitchcock, it often fell to his other, to his screenwriters. I mean, he contributed to his scripts, but it often fell to his screenwriters to uh, beef up the political statements in his movies. And they were usually the ones responsible for any kind of, um, any, any kind of, uh, you know, um, pontificating about um, the political situation. It was usually the screenwriters who had written those bits in. I'm thinking, for instance, about Foreign Correspondent, which is uh, one of the second movie that he made in the US after Rebecca, which is very, very, very much a World War II, England is going to war movie. And Joel McRae, if you've seen the movie, is a foreign correspondent and gives an entire speech at the end about you know the the state of things, and that was that was condoned by Hitchcock. He certainly kept it in the movie, and he was okay with that. But he didn't write that. That wasn't his you know trying to put in any kind of statement. No. Um, next up is Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, Hannah. I just had a quick question about Dame May Witty. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how she got cast in that role? Do you have any information on that? Yeah. She, um, and was she, she his first was choice? One, that's a great question. Was she, she his first yeah. choice as well? Yeah. She was his first choice for that role. She um, was one of the many actors that Hitchcock admired uh, from her stage work. Um, and she did go on to make at least one more movie I know uh, with Hitchcock. She was in, um, suspicion, um, possibly more, I may be blanking on it, but she, uh, she, was, she was one of the many older character actors that Hitchcock admired from their stage work, especially in London. Um, but she, you know, she's delightful and she, she often played sort of dotty types, but this was a much more like savvy kind of sinister almost figure that she still plays in her little, you know, classic way. Thanks. Um, Connie and Dick. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, just to follow up on a, a, something that Elise uh, touched on. Um, it, I had the sense that the script might have been a serious murder mystery on a train and that the comedic elements were essentially the touch of of Hitchcock, and that he may have changed the original, the original thrust of the of the film. Is, is that right, or is that the way it was written in the first place? Yeah, it's always hard to know with Hitchcock movies what the original uh, draft looked like because so many writers contributed to his movies. I think I may have mentioned that last week that um, even the ones who are credited on the film weren't by any stretch all of the people who contributed to the script uh, for the most part. In this case, the, um, the original script did appeal to Hitchcock in large part because of the humor that was in it. So in The Lady Vanishes, it was the screenwriters who were contributing a lot of that humor. But of course, you know, Hitchcock has his own uh, dry sense of humor that, and when I talked about him building up the supporting characters, um, it, that a lot of that humor came out of building up those characters based on uh, just their, their, you know, personalities, um, particularly Caldecott and Charters. Brian? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, my question's about uh, Margaret Lockwood. Yeah. Uh, every time I watch this film, she is just you know, totally luminous and gives a perfectly naturalistic performance. And I know she was a star in England, but she meant never came to Hollywood. Do you know why she just didn't want to, or was there a reason? Yeah, that's such a great question. I agree with you. I love her. She's one of my favorite Hitchcock heroines. I just think that she she radiates in this movie. Um, and she did she did go to Hollywood um, briefly. She uh, for one thing was was in a, the Shirley Temple movie Susanna of the Mounties, um, but very very briefly um, that might have been her only American credit. I'll have to check on that. But it was around that time that she was in Hollywood. But um, yeah, she continued to perform on stage in England too and in television on uh, in England as well. She just had a, a stronger career in England. Um, I'm not honestly sure if she was uh, lured to America um, as so many Brits were. Um, but she, in her case, she, she stayed in England for her entire career and she had a long career. And in fact, she, uh, appeared in a movie that was made a few years after the, two years after the lady vanishes that was made to capitalize on the success of the lady vanishes. So if you're interested in a, um, film that features a lot of the same players here, uh, it was also written by Sidney Galliott and Frank Launder. Um, starring Margaret Lockwood and featuring Caldecott and Charters. And, you know, there they were again. The movie is called Night Train to Munich. Um, it, it's a very, very young Rex Harrison is the leading man. Um, and an uh, up-and-comer named Paul Von Henried before he dropped the Von and was just Paul Henried. Um, and it's, it's a really, uh, if you're talking, you know, you're talking about the comedy in this movie, that movie tries a little bit to have some comedy, but it's a lot more of a stark wartime um, wartime spy movie. Um, Night Train to Munich is what it's called, but that's another of her major roles. Also, as the title implies, takes place a lot on a train. So similar, similar things going on there. Uh, Robin. I think you're muted, sorry. Yeah, uh, you just need to unmute, Robin. When I think of Hitchcock movies, I think of the, that generally I'm, I'm familiar with the idea that they have a political dimension to them for their intrigues. Um, but as far as social issues, uh, I thought on this one at the ending, as well as through it, there was like a women's, it, what we see now as a women's issue, how easy it is to see women as overly emotional, how to use that against them, how they can be uh, committed to asylums and gotten rid of easily uh, by a husband who doesn't want them around anymore or whatever it is. Was this just um, a plot issue for him? Because back then it was, there wasn't a woman's movement. And uh, is, or is it uh, that he sort of has a bit of a social issue side to him? It's a great point. Um, no, the social issues that come up in Hitchcock's films are plot points um, that yeah. we can now read into as social issues. It, uh, the, the, the suspense and the drama around, you know, what putting the characters in these situations and then how they're going to find their way out of these situations is what Hitchcock's focus was. Um, but certainly, I mean, it's also influenced by the writers who worked with him. So in certain cases, you see some, uh, some or, and, and the producers in Hollywood too, especially Selznick who, who uh, Selznick and then later Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox, who had more of an interest in certain social issues that would kind of, they would force upon Hitchcock's work a little bit more. Um, for instance, the movie Spellbound, uh, which stars Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck, uh, is all about psychiatry, which was David O. Selznick was in analysis at the time and was so fascinated with kind of this, you know, <laughs> the way that analysis was, re you know, and Freud's theories and how that was taking, you know, taking over uh, at this point uh, in the 1940s. And so he, he spearheaded that production and, you know, Hitchcock kind of had to weave in more of 
you know, that social issue and that, you know, how that was playing out in the culture. But that was really not his, it, it was never really pushed by Hitchcock specifically. It's a great question. Thank you. I love hearing everyone's voice. This is so great. Yeah. Yes, this is working so well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Barbara, you're next. Um, I was, I thought there were a lot of really funny scenes in it. And the one um, that I remember that just reminds me of Marx Brothers, um, I think it was Monkey Business, where they were stowaways on a ship. Yeah. It's when the two guys, uh, the cricket guys, are in the hotel and they're in the little closet. And it's hysterical when the maid comes in, the two, they're lying together, like so close. Right. To but but then they keep hitting their head and then you know there's the maid also there's the underwear theme that he, we saw in the other film yeah um, so I, I it just reminded me a lot of that Marx Brothers scene where they're all like in the stow weight in a in a I guess it's a janitor's closet or something right. they keep coming in with different things I just yeah. wonder if there's an influence for that yeah um not explicitly but I think that the the physical comedy of it definitely reads and the you know putting these characters in these awkward situations of intimacy was definitely yeah. something that Hitchcock loved um we saw that in the 39 steps where they're handcuffed together and she has to take her clothes or her stockings off right having characters who are forced into intimate situations when they're obviously uncomfortable with it um is is definitely comes up in a lot of his movies Although it seemed like the two guys were pretty comfortable in bed together. Sure, sure, absolutely. They were comfortable with each other, but when the maid comes in and out, that's yeah, like yeah. That's where so much of that physical comedy comes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pat? Oh, Pat, I still think you're on mute. You're going to need to hit unmute. Oh, there. Hi, Hannah and Chris. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I'm just in love with Hannah. I, she knows so much. Um, I was just curious about the musician at the beginning that was at the window and, she, and he gets, uh, it looks like he gets murdered and how that fits in with maybe the song that she had to have memorized at the end or is it just disconnected? And I thought it was really funny when she threw out the coin and didn't even realize that he was, I think, murdered. Yes, it's such a great point. And I think it's funny that that, I think that that's one of those kind of maybe essential plot points that maybe doesn't work so well in the telling of the movie. Cause I think some people, it, it is hard to keep that in your head when so much time goes by before that song has any relevance again. Mm -hmm. um, that man who's singing the song is passing along the secret code. It is that song that she's memorizing that she has to memorize. So she's standing by the window listening intently, trying to memorize this song that she then has to bring to the foreign office. Um, and it's, it's that man, that man is murdered because he's a spy as part of this ring. He's passing along information. But you're totally right to, to take away sort of an ambiguity about it because that song doesn't mean anything until the very end of the movie. So we pay attention to it up front, but then it's, you know, it's totally lost to this other um, plot point, which is that the woman vanishes, right? And that takes up the bulk of the film. Is it uh, Michelle Sherman? Yeah, hi, this is actually Randy. This is a, hey, Randy. Yeah. a wife's account, my wife's account. Um, I can't, I, I remember watching an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents and I looked up the title, it's called Into Thin Air, which, which starred his daughter, Patricia, which was very, very similar to The Lady Vanishes. And I had heard that that was uh, what the episode was based on. Do you have any more information on that? Yeah, that's such a great point. It's been a while since I've seen that episode, but I know exactly which one you're talking about. The, um, the story about a vanishing woman uh, came from, so, there was the source novel that The Lady Vanishes was, that was explicitly um, you know, adapted from, but there was also a story about a woman who vanishes that Hitchcock drew, Hitchcock personally drew inspiration from in making this movie. Not the story that the movie was adapted from, but it was another story in his mind that he remembered that he used as an influence. And it was that story that inspired, he connected it to The Lady Vanishes because 
he he had been using it as a personal inspiration for this, but it was that movie, that story that inspired uh, that episode later. Yeah. Anne? Uh, I know th there are a lot of villains in this movie, but the one that I thought was like the creepiest was the, was the magician. And I don't know if anyone else agrees, but he really, he was good. <laughs> and I, I didn't recognize the actor. I didn't know who we hadn't seen him before. Yeah, I forget actually who he is. Um, you're right though. He is absolutely, he, you know, it, I think it reminded me also of the, um, in the, in the 39 steps, that moment where he's uh, on the train looking up from the newspaper. Can, does everyone remember what I'm, what I'm talking about? He sees the headline, Robert Donat in the 39 steps sees the headline that the police want him. And he looks up from the paper and he sees this totally creepy looking, you know, like bra salesman who's looking at him like over the top of the page. And it was that trope, I think that brings out so much of the creepiness in those characters. Um, and, and like I said, Hitchcock loved to um, plagiarize himself. And so that same trope of the person sitting on the, in the train car looking up, seeing the people around looking at them um, and letting the sinisterness of their faces kind of tell you everything you need to know about those characters uh, is, is great. Of course, also the scene where they, where they uh, struggle with Dapo is the character's name, right? And all of the vanishing, I mean, this is totally Hitchcock, all of the magician tricks that are in that room that help people vanish, I mean, just contributes to the whole theme of the lady vanishing. There's the actual vanishing box. There's the, you know, the um, false bottom in the crate. Yeah, but I also think in that scene, um, that's really where, um, the two main characters solidify their relationship yeah. going through that experience, you know? Yeah. Which it's is one nice. of, It's really, it's one of, I mean, Hitchcock did not always spend time developing the relationships of the leading man and leading lady in his movies. I mean, that is a criticism that, that can fairly be, uh, you know, levied against him that the, the romances that are supposed to blossom in so many of his movies don't really, you know, sometimes the chemistry is not there. Sometimes just the focus on building their relationship isn't there. But this is one of those movies I think that really does this, this relationship between the two characters is, is kind of genuinely sweet. There are no other hands up, but just looking over a chat. Oh, uh, yeah, Reese, Reese, yep. Uh, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Okay, got it. You have me there. Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, so I, I don't see Hannah. Where is she? I'm okay. still here. Okay. Um, so I want to go back to the uh, conceit of using the music um, to convey the the uh, the secret code. Um, it only really works because the uh, character that she sings it to is a musician and we know because he plays the clarinet in the beginning. So I was just wondering if that was in the book. Um, and, you know, that was the first question. I have, I have one other question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, the, it, he was changed into a, a folk music scholar by the screenwriters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Do you have it? You had a question as well. How long it took to make the movie? Steve wanted to know. Um, how long? Not very long. A couple of weeks. It, it was. Uh, I don't know exactly how many weeks, but it was. It was a very short turnaround. And and one other uh, question, thing that related to a question that I asked in the last uh, series that you did um, about how we don't really get upset about the people that die. In this case, I think we were all really happy that the man that was shot at the end, who was giving the girlfriend a hard time, um, actually dies. This is the first time. I felt, yeah. yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, and he is a stand-in for kind of an, a person who's taking a, a, a foolish stance politically. Mm -hmm. um, right. Not only is he an unsympathetic character, but at the time that would have read as someone who is, you know, trying to make peace with Nazis, essentially, mm -hmm. and that that's kind of a foolish um, enterprise. And he, you know, pay, he suffers the consequence. He, he has this harsh reality check. Mm -hmm. uh they or the rest of them do 
I just wanted to call attention to a chat that or a thread that's been going on in the chat. Um, Elise raised a question um, about MacGuffins and the MacGuffin in this film. And Bob shared a great article, which I recommend everyone hunt down in the chat, listing all of Hitchcock's best MacGuffins. Um, and uh, the question was about whether or not um, that the lady who vanishes could be the MacGuffin. Um, so uh, there's some interesting bit in the thread there if you want to take a look. Hannah, I don't know if you want to address that. Um, and then we can get to John's question. For sure. Yeah, the MacGuffin in this um, particular movie is the coded song. It's the thing that they're trying to smuggle out of the country. Um, other in the 39 steps, it was the thing that Mr. Memory had to memorize. The, it, it's usually some sort of secret code or secret item um, that's being smuggled or that they're trying to stop from being smuggled. Uh, you can think of it that way. I can't think of an example where a character, although that article, I'll take a, that, I know that article and I think that that will definitely clarify all of the, all of the MacGuffins that show up in Hitchcock movies. But I can't think offhand of an example where a person is a MacGuffin. Maybe somebody can help me out with that. But yeah, in this case, it's that coded song. John? I wanted to thank Hannah for what a wonderful job she's doing on these that are really uh, so interesting and and stimulating. Thank thank you so much for uh, for doing these. And I'm really exciting. It, it's really exciting that you're going to do these uh, every month for the rest of the year. I really like how this compares uh, viewing it back to back with the uh, 39 steps and how many of the themes and the approach of the filmmaking are so similar that they're so much romantic comedies, both of them, uh, and how that is really the, there's, there's such handsome, infectious couples that you're rooting for them the whole time. And that, that really draws you in and all the suspense is almost the secondary part uh, of both of the movies. And going right down to uh, the similarities with that there's a musical theme that's going through the, the hero's head to the end. And like the 39 steps, the ending of this is so wonderful. That last shot, which is about, I don't know, 45 second, 60 second shot where they're sitting there and then he forgets uh, the song and then they go in to be reunited. Talk, talk about that the end shot a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And you're so right also to point out all of these similarities. The, the you know, it was Robert Donat remembering the song that introduced Mr. Memory in the 39 steps that led him to kind of get, you know, the, get to the place that where the movie ends. Um, the very end, uh, I, Hitchcock's main tweaks to the script were at the very beginning and the very end. Um, and certainly that last uh, shot, the way that it's framed was all Hitchcock. Um, whether it was written exactly by him in that moment or, or written before by the screenwriters, uh, I think that resolution was there all along, but the way that uh, you, you are in that waiting room and then go into that room where she's playing the song and then you suddenly see her uh, and then all the people who are in that, that shot, very much reminiscent of all of, all of the layers that's going on in the, at the end of the 39 steps too. Yeah, it feels like the one really bravura uh, cinematic shot in the film is that end shot. Whereas the 39 Steps, I, 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 39 Steps must have had a slightly larger budget. Uh, there's much more creative filmmaking in 39 Steps. This is very, the filmmaking almost takes a back seat to the characters and the, you know, the romantic comedy. Very, very much so. And like I said, the, um, the resources were kind of minimal. And the reason why there aren't these bravura cinematic shots in The Lady Vanishes is because they simply couldn't achieve that in the confined sets that they had to work with. Um, and there was a significant financial, um, you know, a lot of the British uh, studios were facing bankruptcy in the years between when The 39 Steps was made and The Lady Vanishes was made. And there were just rampant layoffs that were going on and film studios were uh, shrinking in terms of what they could 
accomplish. And so he, he did, he was working with a, a bigger budget with more resources uh, for the 39 steps shortly thereafter. Um, I mentioned Michael Balkin who was offering him this job to stay in England uh, at MGM. Michael Balkin was fired from his previous job as Hitchcock's boss and then was you know, picked up by MGM. He went on to lead Ealing Studios, which uh, was responsible for all of the great British movies that came out of the post-war era, movies like uh, The Lady Killers, The Man in the White Suit, um, Kind Hearts and Coronets, all these like very, very, very British movies of the 1940s. Um, he, was, he was the one who produced them, but the British film industry was in a really precarious place, so much so that he was fired. So Hitchcock was really working with um, minimal resources at this particular moment. Yeah. One other point I wanted to bring up, uh, Chris, was, and I'm sure uh, most people know this, is the with uh, Michael Gred Redgrave, the amazing acting family lineage yeah. that he has with his two children, uh, Lynn and Vanessa Redgrave, and his grandchildren with Natasha Richardson and I think there are other grandchildren also. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, he was the patriarch of this, you know, the British Barrymores, basically, like the, you know, acting legacy, you know, family that was just uh, so, so prolific. But this was his first major movie role, for sure. Well, we are just at the hour mark and I don't see any other questions. Hannah, is there anything you would like to say to wrap us up? Just that I am just so grateful to all of you. This is so, so awesome um, to hear all of your, I'm so grateful that I got to hear your voices and we got to have more of a discussion this time. And I, I very much hope we can continue uh, in this vein moving forward. Um, and I, I, hope, I hope you learned something new and enjoyed it. I, I certainly enjoyed hearing from you. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight for this discussion and uh, for leading us through these two uh, Hitchcock films, Hannah, and we're very excited uh, to see what films we end up picking for the rest of the year and upcoming. Um, everyone, please check your emails and check our websites as we announce those. Um, we'll be locking they're all gonna be, things. They're all going to be film noirs, right, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, thank you. Yeah, anyone, if, if you have suggestions, please send them in. Uh, we'd love to see any lists or things that uh, you all come up with um, as well. Um, you, haven't the, you haven't picked out the next two yet. I think I will we, try in some way to keep things a little bit like seasonally thematic. So just bear that in mind that there might be a tie in. So maybe what's going on at that time of year, but we'll, we'll go from suggestions as well. Yeah. All right, so pull out your Valentine's Day lists. All right. <laughs> Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much to Hannah for leading us through. We'll see you at the next one. Good night, thank everyone. You, Chris.